Uh, great, good morning. Uh, in the previous film uh, in this series, wandering about as it is, um, like a tributary in the, dent in the desert, I talked uh, about some of my concerns, some of my questions, some of my unanswered questions, um, and some very, very particular objections to, say, Christianity. And I want to go over some, some other general trends that lend somewhat of a paradoxical quality to the religious dimension of human life that I claim is natural, ubiquitous, and is not going anywhere. Um, if it did, people would stop selling science fiction novels and uh, folk tales and, and all kinds of things. Music, everything uh, in the entertainment, everything about culture is is made up and embellished and uh, it has elements of truth to it um, and in fact its most fictional elements can be some more truthful than sometimes very explicit descriptions of human experience um, so how we convey knowledge through different organizations of letters and motifs and themes um, is very diverse and just because it exists in a so-called religious book doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't carry knowledge, um, but it doesn't mean that it that it carries that it does in 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 different cases, and and just because it carries knowledge doesn't mean it doesn't come with other baggage, other just very outlandish ideas that would be perfectly fine in a science fiction book, but can be extremely dangerous when you start to believe that they're actually true and they have particular effects upon your mind other than the effect of just simply believing something with other people and that's the paradoxical thing about religion uh, particularly as I, I think a lot of it is the product of and is very charming to less than ideal human brain function and that is an entire you know story in itself is that religions and sciences, science fictions and science facts, even if they were extremely factual, um, have benefits to people, are compelling for people, um, change how people think in ways that can be deemed very personally beneficial and beneficial to different aspects of society, certainly at least how it's viewed uh, through different lenses. And uh, this effect can be seen as completely psychological. Um, I can read Charles Dickens and have what I would call spiritual experiences. That doesn't mean that Oliver Twist or A Tale of Two Cities was written by divine inspiration. Unless, of course, maybe anything can be written by divine inspiration. And certainly couldn't claim that it was the only thing and the most divinely inspired book, right? Um, I would like to say that I, I feel um, less averse to criticizing different religions because I've entertained them. I've entertained Christianity. I've ent I entertained Scientology. I've entertained uh, different Mayan-type Western cults. I've entertained, um, I think I said Scientology. I've, I've entertained Buddhism. Um, I've entertained, say, the Anastasia series by Vladimir McGray, which I think is a very sophisticated series of books. So the author um, did a great job of marketing, did a great job of laying a psychological basis that, as I say, in, in many cases comes from a very sincere interest in one's beliefs. And in the Anastasia series, definitely an agrarian mythology, a pseudo, sort of quasi-Christian agrarian mythology, um, sort of about the some original, sort of austere purity in the human race, um, and makes some almost anthropological claims or hypotheses that human beings started off at a very high level and descended and that his narratives are narratives, are stories, are a culture about what we saw as relevant, about our own condition, um, and what had led us there, changed as we lost 
the full use of our brains. While he, he posits that a parallel, very sparsely populated uh, heritage maintained some continuity from that original state, lived separate from society, um, and, uh, and he employs almost biblical motifs in how this, this primeval, high human functioning family might pick people from the descended, the fallen civilization in order to keep their family line going. Um, and would choose among the poets and what he considers more refined people. I'm not saying, you know, I read poetry, I'm not saying that that's true, but this is the, the author. And uh, the author himself is picked by such a woman about 25 years ago uh, named Anastasia, who is the title uh, book in this series, the Ringing Cedar series. And uh, the author himself paints himself as a, as a very dubious character, an entrepreneur, uh, selfish, self-absorbed, horny, tries to rape her in the first day that he meets her. Um, and she begins to basically narrate or teach the substance of, the, of a series of eight or nine books about ancient human culture and how to raise children and our connection to food and very, again, very agrarian, sort of quasi-Orthodox Christian books um, that give a sequence of pictures of history and then also provide a sort of science of the sequence of images and how they can have effects upon how we think. And he or she uh, claims that the sequence of images that human beings live out, which she calls, um, she sees as almost like a technology, is that humans started out barbaric, um, uh, had uh, entered into all kinds of wars, became even more barbaric, and then became convinced that a society utterly barbaric um, was one of full of cheery, happy, healthiest people ever that were actually obese and dying and surrounded by inanimate objects, smiling but not really happy inside. Which is not necessarily a completely stupid idea. And then replaces that with a sequence of originally extremely happy, healthy, intelligent people who then, through their own poor choices and pride and competition around how to get the favor of God, descended into a more competitive, unnecessarily destructive state, were then compelled to enter into wars by various people who retained the capacity to control the human mind once it was reduced from its original strata of, of operation, and then we got more and more pushed into slavery and eventually democracy, the introduction of money to make people enjoy their slavery. Um, and then to really basically self-organize their own penitentiary um, in order to proliferate then a sequence of myths and so forth that keep them virtually inebriated and uh, utterly unthinking about what had led them into that condition. Um, and indeed provides some sort of explanation for the, I would say, the impossible situation in which civilization exists, except for some woman named Anastasia who is in a sense, separate from civilization and has maintained a mental power to have influence over people in their gardens and growing their lung seeds and, and hopefully growing uh, family homes and having children without sex and um, that he mitigates by saying, well, okay, you can purify each other. All these elaborate kinds of ancient rituals around the conception of children and the merging of the, the image and mental and physical being of a man and woman so that they could have children that uh, were as closely connected psychologically to those particular people and not to other lovers as possible. So as you can see, very elaborate books. And what Vladimir McGray, the author, does so well is that he paints himself as the narrator as such a bumbling idiot that's so stupid, you never consider the fact that this man in real life is smart enough to create a spiritual uh, quasi-historical narrative of truly astronomical uh, proportions in terms of cultural history and gets into like the man's interaction with the stars and, and uh, animal husbandry and, uh, and uh, Anastasia's ability to sort of predict the future <coughs> and uh, has a dream that she predicts and is mentally deemed capable of helping everyone in the world realize over time as we break the, the bonds of what she calls the dark forces. And she goes through certain rituals where she deals with the, the uh, sort of superhuman anger that is always attacking 
the world and attempts to attack Anastasia and sends scientists in order to, to capture or kill her. And she goes through purification where she is broken down and is kept alive by her sanctuary in nature that is extremely um, interested in her well-being and gives her a lot of energy and power. The animals serve her and all kinds of things. She can talk to the eagles and the bears and it keeps her alive and she manages to stagger into the water and she does so. She undergoes a ritual where she communicates with the Creator and uh, she becomes capable of realizing her, her great dream, her beautiful dream, while uh, the author of Latimer questions having to write these books that people are never going to believe them and they just they're going to think they're stupid but after further consideration considerate consideration I see how you know this makes a lot of sense and there's certain things I can't put in the book because people will never believe it and uh, what I want to show in saying all this is that without even thinking about it ambitious people know however sincere they may be and religion is a mixture of sincerity and psychological benefits and a certain degree of lying. It, it always is. Um, ambitious people know that human beings, if they can, you can get their interest in a realm beyond their ken, that can somehow provide for a story of life where they are better than they've been taught to think and they have some hope in deciding uh, something of a happier fortune for themselves and their children, they can be in better relationship to the Creator, whoever or whatever that may be, um, then in this case Vladimir uh, is able to create someone that has that kind of stature and dissociate himself from the creation of this character <coughs> by making himself in the books look stupid. And, uh, and indeed the books gained an enormous interest, certainly in Russia, and uh, the books are very Russian in that sense. I mean, this is a part of the world that's maintained a, a strong agrarian Orthodox Christian heritage. And so it's not surprising that he creates a mythology around a human agrarian heritage that has fought and kept at bay uh, the forces of the Roman Empire from um, colonializing them or colonizing them. And uh, so it is a wonderful, incredible folk spiritual tale, certainly better than, say, something like the Celestine Prophecy, which is, has its own sort of psychopolitics, again, pop psychology, and put into a spiritual grand scale um, that creates a, a larger interest, sort of a more expansive kind of theater for the human imagination. Um, and then given the, given the touch of reality, given the touch of this actually happened and could actually happen, um, from an author's perspective, I would not be interested, but I could see the ambitious nature of creating a science fiction or spiritual science fiction and to give it the touch of biography, give it the touch of this is a true story. Every film that you watch when they say it's a true story at the beginning becomes that much more enthralling. Um, the high drama, the, his, the you know, the, it's just very much more interesting. So, um, in the books, um, Anastasia does all kinds of things, interacts with the world, Vladimir interacts with the world. No evidence, no pictures, um, no evidence ever exists of her existence or indeed anything that he, he does in these books. Um, they are taken as a complete uh, history in themselves and they are the only evidence of her existence, which is a combination as with any icon of your belief and the, uh, the, the elaborate nature of the story presented and however compelling it is to you. And he even says in the book, if, it's, if she says, if, you know, some people will believe in me and some people won't. Um, this doesn't mean that she doesn't exist, but it, there is no evidence of her existence. And as long as you can't believe that someone could make this up, and if you've read any number of books in the world, authors can be extremely imaginative and very compelling. Um, then, uh, I mean, I read Congo by Michael Crichton about an ape that can talk sign language and, you know, finding a place in the jungle where gorillas were taught by an ancient race to, to murder any trespassers something that gorillas certainly shouldn't really be able to do, certainly not with the dexterity that they're, they're able to demonstrate. Um, so, uh, people can create very elaborate narratives. That they can doesn't mean that any particular narrative is false, uh, but again, um, books in and of themselves can, get, can give you spiritual experiences. And ambitious authors, certainly people who start cults, like the Anastasia one, for instance, 
are able to create something. Um, well, I think he's very unique in this sense. He created a character. Um, uh, L. Ron Hubbard created a character out of himself. Vladimir created an actual fictional character, breathed life into her, and then created a narrative that made it impossible that he could have created this character. Um, and so you have no idea of the intelligence or the motivation of the author, which may as well be quite, uh, quite pure in many respects. The, the book seems to just create a lot of good feelings for people, and they're very interesting. And if, if he might have written a book and said, look, these are just my ideas of history, and that would be compelling in itself. But the way he did it, it made it ten times more compelling. And being compelling is something that ambitious human beings want to do. They want to be compelling. As I, as I tell, make this video, I obviously want to be compelling. I want to be, every time you have a thought, there's a sense of wanting to communicate that thought. You want to provoke people to entertain that thought, to think that it's worth considering. Um, and different people, uh, uh, and you know, Vladimir McGray is probably honest about one thing. He is a businessman, and I'm sure he's made a lot of money off of this. And perhaps through the the people who translated into English, I don't know. You never hear about that, right? You never hear about how much money these books have made. But they opened their own publishing company in Kauai, um, and uh, I think it has sold a fair amount. Um, in the books, he relates almost autobiographically how he was trying to sell the books on street corners. Um, he was trying to start a business. He almost died. Anastasia kept him alive with her energy and and all these kinds of things. Um, People, when they read the Quran or they read the Bible, they see stories and they think, nobody could possibly make this up. Nobody could possibly know these things. Um, there's science in the Quran. There's science in the Bible. The Quran says things about the human brain that nobody could have known. Well, the fact is that human beings have known all kinds of things. As with Vladimir, as with the Quran, sometimes stories are told um, where God is the source of this knowledge. But people forget that human beings, over huge tracts of time, are capable of learning things and intuiting things, and are capable, the average farmer can perceive and make deductions about nature that the average city dweller can't make, and it might seem metaphysical to them. But if you pay attention to different levels of intelligence of yourself and society and the people around you, um, you could seem like a psychic, but you're just paying more attention. There's just this diverse range of how we pay attention to things and what information we're able to pick up. So the paradox of religion is that it can seem very unique, say a religious saint or icon, a book. It can seem like it's the only thing that's ever had or could have a certain effect upon you. But many different science fiction books or many different human tales can have a spiritual effect on people. I had a friend, Hinduism was another religion I've entertained, and she would go see the hugging saint, Amachi, who would leave her ashram in, in India and travel around North America and Europe. And she would often hug thousands of people on the weekend and over a period of three days. Um, now, if you keep in, in mind that the average person may well donate 10 American dollars on average, she's pulling in a quarter million dollars on a weekend. And Undoubtedly, this money is being funneled into a huge philanthropic organization and helping people and providing hospital care and rebuilding houses after storms. I make absolutely no uh, claims about her being you know, nefarious in any way. I think there are just people... Well, one thing is that when this woman enters the room, my friend goes and follows her and gets hugged and, and all this stuff. She's not my friend anymore. She's a psychopath. But... Um, came from a very seriously psychopathic alcoholic family, but interesting family too, American family, uh, uh, a, not a, a somewhat well-known author was her grandfather. Um, she says, I feel something, I feel something in the air when she enters the room, and you know, she's this divine incarnation of Kali and Shiva and, and all these kinds of things. Um, but the teenage girl feels the same thing when Justin Bieber comes into the room. So how do you distinguish between the two? If the feeling means that they're divine, is Justin Bieber a spiritual incarnation of, of uh, Chattanooga or Ogopogo or, or Vishnu? Um, who knows, right? Um, it's open to discussion. It doesn't mean that it's not. But in religion, we're entering a very ethereal realm that human beings, I don't think, have ever really come to a succinct appreciation for. Um, and what we enter into when we enter into this sort of narcotic-like zone of um, 
shedding our mortal coil psychologically and entering into a realm of psychomythology um, and its effect upon us, what we find compelling when something jumps off the page from just a story to something that galvanizes a stream of knowledge passed across generations. Human beings, uh, one of the most interesting things I learned or that I, I've taken to understand is that one of the primary functions of life is to communicate. Cells need to communicate. The sun and the wind need to communicate. Things are, without getting too metaphysical, are enjoying cause and effect relationships across all bounds. So that, that's something you can sort of like logically deduce. And so it's not a step further to say that things are communicating, right? Um, anything that has substance or energy is involved in interacting or communicating with every other thing. And um, on, big, on the biggest scales and the smallest scales. So whether you're looking at the, uh, the, the Mahabharata or the, the Vedas of India and all the compendiums of, with, compendium of wisdom and the science and Vedanta, um, um, uh, what's the word? Oh, it'll come to me. Um, there's different Indian healing systems and, and all that kind of thing. It's very specific and, you know, and it's combined with huge... Uh, uh, mythology of deities and India has a huge history of saints and altered states of consciousness and stories about meeting gods and becoming their disciple and, and the paradox of religion is that this realm that may or may not be explicitly true that may or may not be unique to a certain book or a certain person does produce very charitable uh, behavior heightened states of being better relationships maybe better communication, better health, helps people's constitution in making healthier choices, turning from lives of crime, turning from lives of abuse. Uh, people do change in some ways, but again, I, I don't think religion can claim to rehabilitate the kinds of mental illness, the scales of mental illness that our society produces. And in many cases, people very ill are attracted to religion precisely because it won't ever really change them except on the surface. So it's a very paradoxical, very problematic, it's not simple, and it's complicated. And sometimes people don't like complicated. They would rather just believe that their religion does good things, and that's it. They don't want to think that it exists in a host of other religions with other people who have the same kinds of things. And it's interesting that religions claim to be so unique. One of the big things about Islam is that it is a unique word of God. It is the final and last testament with Christians. You have to believe in Jesus. It is the unique story of the world with evolution. It is the absolutely only way the world could have got where it is. And it's not unintelligent. It's just none of these things actually have proof. And maybe it's just impossible to prove. And human beings are so wonderful and ambitious that they're capable of having a reach that exceeds their grasp. Else, what's heaven for, as Robert Browning said? So there's... Else, what's religion for? What's imagination for? What's playing, whether you're an opportunist, whether you're, you're just born with a certain talent. Amachi, the hugging saint, just says, I was born with a talent. And some people in our society uh, have certain talents and get a certain interest. Maybe you're surrounded by people who are interested in, in helping encourage the talent, the talent or the effect it has on people, and that generate cults around them. Uh, that can be enormously charitable and all these other things. People like to focus on other people. Look at modern television today. We love to celebrate stars and celebrities. Um, they galvanize us. They, they focus our energy. And indeed, the mind loves to be focused on something. Um, from a mobile in a crib to staring at the moon at night um, to staring at a dot on your own head or a picture of Sheba inside your third eye, people love to focus. Um, and uh, focus sometimes relaxes the mind. So it can be a simple kind of technology, the idea of focus, that can have a lot of effects. And when something has a positive effect on people, be it a drug or a cult, a lot of the warp and weft, the ongoing sort of Amazon river of human mythology and religion, finds a way of just sort of taking it into her loving arms and sharing some of the validity conferred upon it by these ancient myths and stories and gods. And in so doing, the, the tradition of, of divinity, of, of, of lifting up certain uh, divine icons and mythologies onto a certain level 
distinct from every other mythology in the world. Something that's basically B-grade science fiction that's taken off of the science fiction section and put into the religion section, or the self-help section, or the spiritual section, or the New Age section. And in turn, there are even things, I think, that are woven or cut from the same cloth that are put into the science section, and the medicine section, and the diet section. How many myths exist in the realm of diet? How many poor assumptions are made about diet? Diets that are always standardized, because that's the only way to sell books. You can't sell a book that says, you know what, I can't tell you how to eat. It's just something you have to learn by yourself, period, published. No one's going to read that. Right. And there are some interesting things. Please don't dismiss the Anastasia books. Because the other paradox about religion, about uh, confidence tricksters, about gold diggers, about people who just have a wonderful talent for uniting their thirst for money with providing a product to people. And uh, L. Ron Hubbard provided a product. Right? Uh, Vladimir McGray provided a product. Sometimes these products are really deadly and dangerous. Charles Manson provided a very deadly product. But other people who have different kinds of intelligence and different levels and provide other products. And the fact that it's a product and the fact that it has um, wires and curtains and, and swings and things behind it that make the show go on for the party that is your mind um, doesn't mean that it doesn't have incredible value. And humans are always going to find uh, mythologies to celebrate and to provide a kind of balm for the injuries to the soul. Uh, like I said, Charles Dickens has done that to me more, almost more than any other author in the world. Um, just, I find him very relaxing um, to read. I think for all these reasons that someone could say, well, you, you don't believe in a divine intelligence. For all these reasons, I absolutely do believe in a supremely creative intelligence. Um, the thing is, is that I'm coming closer to, to thinking that it's just very boring and dull to admit that you don't know anything and that everything you've ever thought might not be as true or true at all and, uh, and that we may just be starting from the beginning. We may never have really moved anywhere in terms of our understanding of ourselves or the cosmos or a creator. And it may just be up to us to make our own religion, our own little place, because I think people do anyway. Whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist, you make your own, you give it your own touch, you give it your own spin. I, I learned to write in school, and everyone wrote the same way. Right? We all wrote the same letters. But eventually, you're writing. A lot of people don't write, you know, cursively anymore. But it became became your own, your signature. No one else has that type of writing. And I think eating, and I think belief, I think thinking it is always going to be that way. And the fact that there are standards or you know, conglomerations of you know, homogeneous beliefs or sciences, I don't think is necessarily evil, um, but you can't stop there. Um, that is an instrument that makes it easier to run a society, um, but it's not always the healthiest thing for everyone. It's just not that simple. Um, uh, science, as many scientists will say, is not just one blob of a thing. It is a process. It is uh, a whole bunch of actions undertaken by people who have trained very hard in particular academic disciplines. Um, but even that in itself doesn't make the products of their work beyond scrutiny, even when it's peer-reviewed and published in papers. Um, the reason it's published is to communicate something, and when you communicate something, it means you're interested in what people think and whether you can convince them in what's being said. And there's certainly a, a level of fiction in, in the scientific published world. Um, whether it's intentional or not. Um, that's without a doubt. Um, there are narratives that find their way. There are political narratives, there are economic narratives, there are psychological narratives, there are biases, depending on where you've come from. The human mind shows us one thing, and this is why we're so, I think, ignorant and want to be ignorant of, of the level of, of how imaginative the mind really is, um, and needs to be in many cases, especially under abnormal social conditions, is that um, we're always going to ascribe a level of certainty to things um, more than the evidence can bear. Um, we are always going to be interested in telling some kind of a story and fitting a story around something and to seeing a sequence of cause and effect that we can't really necessarily show, to read causation into correlation. Um, scientists do this, religious people do this. Um, we are always always going to
betray an enormous plasticity and diversity in what we think is relevant out of all the information that we're taking in through people, through places, through experience, through generations. Um, the idea that some distinct scintilla of truth can be passed along undisturbed by generations of people, whether they're scientists or not, is on the level of naivety of a five-year-old thinking that they can flap their wings and go to the moon. It feels like it could be true, and it's wonderful, and the feelings are a healthy part of human development. If we took away imagination, the world would stop. But it doesn't mean that it's true. And, uh, and so what are people left with is manipulating words like the truth and just calling things the truth. And if they say the word the truth enough, then it is the truth. Well, there's things that work for you. Um, there's things you can say you understand, the things that have benefit effect on your life. But I think the truth is really outside our comprehension in many ways. The truth, not a truth, is something involved with all of life. Um, so I think our best bet is to get the benefit of the truth, the benefit of the life, and not to constrain gaining those benefits to understanding the truth in our cognitive faculties. Um, and in gaining the benefits of the truth and life and putting ourselves in the way of the flow of this great creation, uh, we can improve what determinations we are able to make and, uh, and get more of the benefits of the flow of that life and enter into a positive economy, a true economy of human psychology and biology instead of um, getting into a state where we're actually attempting to restrict that flow um, for, what, for, what, for what we've reduced life to in, in concept and in practice. You know, and uh, this line of thought has been very productive for me, you know, because uh, I lived around a friend, a lady who is a psychopath, who spent 20 years studying under the Maharishi, spent 10 years in a Qigong school. And I'm convinced that the Maharishi and, and the leader of her Qigong school were extremely competent men, very knowledgeable. And the Maharishi is an extremely knowledgeable Vedic, uh, you know, Ayurveda, that was the medicine that I was thinking of. So the practice of Ayurveda has certain scientific aspects that are contained and couched in hugely mythological stories. Um, indeed, what can have the effect of fact upon the mind um, can involve a lot of mythology. Excuse me. Oh. Please excuse me. Um, I lived around this woman, and she had studied under these masters. And she had been in a Qigong health system. She was one of the senior instructors of the system. And uh, I saw how the people in the school looked at her, and they put her on a pedestal, and she could do no wrong. And she was at a different spiritual period, and she would come back from seeing the hugging saint, and she would talk about Abba, and she would lay sometimes, she'd come home and she'd lay in the hammock in a beatific state and talk about how she received this hug, and it was so special and so unique. And then a friend came up who was visiting, and two friends, and they said, oh, let's just hug each other. Oh, yeah, that was special, and that was unique. And I thought that they were being quite rude, and then I realized the sense to it is like, why is one person's hug more important than another? Well, when someone reaches iconic status when they have what could be called, I suppose, a divine talent for entering into the world of human psychomythology and, and taking a commanding place in it for charitable reasons or for harmful ones, um, they attract a very unique kind of attention that confers a spiritual kind of power upon the person devoted to them. Just having that focus of that person and the paradox, of course, is that this can have tremendously positive benefits for people that in themselves then go to proving that this woman is actually an incarnation when in fact just a complex interaction of culture and mind is going on that some people are quite talented at uh, taking a commanding place and other people um, have propensities for devoting their energy to and, uh, and, and enjoying those benefits. And that takes discipline, it takes devotion, it takes faith. Um, and all those kinds of things. Faith is believing in something that may not necessarily be true, but has benefits and feels true as far as you know. And um, everyone uses faith. Faith is a wonderful thing because it means acknowledging that there are things, perhaps benefits, as I say, in life, that you will never be able to comprehend, but whose benefits you can put yourself in receipt of, um, which is completely the opposite of, of a lot of Western culture in the sense of, or white culture or European culture, uh, whatever you want to call it, where um, we think that um, 
Knowledge or happiness will never respond to anything but brute for force and analysis. Um, and it's definitely an American way to go about things. Um, uh, but, and nothing ever just comes to you. You know, you have to just get out there and work and drop bombs on someone and analyze the fuck out of, out of a molecule or DNA and get the entire genome sequenced and find the genome of, like, deadly viruses and all those things. That's the only thing that's ever going to make people happy. And you'll see a lot of people who will champion this somewhat religious scientific cause and say, this takes us forward. All these other religions are stupid. This is the only thing that's ever going to save us from ourselves. And, of course, sounding just like any other religious sea law. But thousands of years of analyzing and bending metals and ideas into new shapes has not really statistically produced a less perilous world. It, there's simply more people um, occupying positions of, of a certain amount of limited privilege and, and liberty, um, which is extolled as, as though it should be um, authoritative and, uh, and universally compelling to everyone else. Um, the disparities in, in wealth and health in the world are probably more extraordinary than they've ever been. Um, I think we can boast, among other things, to have the least aware, least educated, um, most affluent, poorly fed and malnourished population on the earth in the history um, that has been recorded. Um, so I don't think bending nature and man into shape under the... Uh, penetrating gaze of science and technology has really gotten us as far as we think, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't got its benefits. Um, we've simply lost proportion. And um, again, the idea that if you're a scientist, that your mind is not constrained in terms of how it perceives the relevance of such an incredible wealth of information, psychological, physical, um, and uh, cultural, social, experiential, um, is is naive in the extreme. Um, but that's one of the basic tenets of science as a religion, is that none of that stuff should have any influence and doesn't have any influence over a, a sufficiently sensible person. And it has benefits, at least, in making that assumption and in trying to make that the case. And the flip side, of course, is that science and empiricism can mitigate for a lot of the um, distortions and eccentricities that exist in religions, either because they're religions or because they attract people um, of a level of, of mental depravity that the society as a whole is exceptional at producing. Um, so it's just a complicated issue. I take something from every religion that I've seen, but at the end of the day, I think the difficult part is that we're left on our own creative faculties to make of it what we will. And uh, I... Uh, I believe that there is a highest level of intelligence in nature. You could make the claim there's different orders of intelligence. I think nature has administrative functions in which we take, I think, a very significant role. And then we're left. Uh, it may just may be that after thousands or even millions of years that we just, we don't necessarily proceed in the most logical sequence. It could be that some things get better and some things get worse. It could mean that the warp and weft of the, of the, uh, molecule of human imagination, empirical thought, observation, perception, what is relevant, bias, psychology, society, fear, death, disease, brutality, um, changes drastically in a million different ways from one day to the next, let alone one generation to generation. And they're just, there should be, there could be, uh, we perhaps could pursue a science of whole life and psychology, but not all the Hinduism, not all the science, not all the evolution, not all the agrarianism, not all the anachronistic, forward-thinking, pro progressive, technological, anything and everything in the world is necessarily taking us in that direction unless we ourselves take a considerable amount of responsibility, however imposing it is to acknowledge that we may, there may not be any clear path out of the situation that we're in. And it just might be a very difficult problem. And... Uh, and if we're going to use beliefs, if we're going to use uh, different imaginative ways to, to sort of thatch our huts in our, in our little existence, and not, not unimportant, but, but diminutive existence, um, maybe it's better to be a little more self-aware about that. Um, I find that helpful. I find life more enchanting for acknowledging um, 
how easily influenced I am, how sincere and how sincerely talented people can be in taking command of the nervous system, if you will, of the human imagination, spiritual, science, scientific, or anything else that it may be. And uh, people do pop up along the way, Sylvia Brown, um, who just can command this territory. Um, and in some cases can, can betray some very unethical qualities because um, that's human beings. Uh, just because they have a talent, just because they can command your attention doesn't mean they're actually worth your attention. Um, that's just another part of the paradox of religion and uh, how, we, how we turn people to icons and the psychology of, of iconography. Um, so I just want to acknowledge Ed Upside Down made an interesting comment on the last video about the introduction of language. And do, I'm very interested in myself in the development of language just in, in infant brain development and uh, <clears throat> what kinds of conditions attend the development of language and how we, uh, what capacities we retain or what capacities we possess to organize um, not just physical, tangible letters, but, uh, but also just the, the string of almost superluminal images that we can impress upon one another in the intervening space of, of psyche, of time. And uh, um, Eric Daniel Brown uh, made a reference in, in uh, one of the last couple of videos about uh, leaving a legacy for your children, and uh, and his realization that you know you can't assume that if you passed away today, your children would would have a lot of occasion to to recollect who you really were, especially if if you passed away at a very young age. So uh, that's of course something I'm very interested in. It's one of the reasons that I make these videos, and I thank him for his contribution. I thank everyone for their contribution. Um, just, just the interest is is nice and it's uh, it's pleasant and it's flattering, and uh, I love the idea of uh, who wouldn't engaging in a project project of discovery of creative intelligence of human heritage, where, lo and behold, we just can't assume that uh, that any canon of human literature, science, or religion is necessarily true, and uh, that is uh, heretical in many cases, but I think it puts us in the way of maybe exercising a little more choice and, and, and taking a little more choice and command of getting the full benefits of the entire animal of the human imagination and uh, its animation no less by I think a, an incredible creative intelligence in our own um, so there's room here to respect everything without giving it our very soul uh, and certainly any sort of reasonable scrutiny it's a huge project here on earth. We all have the tendency to assume that things or some things are going better than they are uh, and that the things or the people to whom we ascribe great even superhuman value, um, as beneficial as that may be, um, may not be um, uh, something that has uh, predictable, uh, as predictable benefits as we like and is certainly not as unique as we like it to be especially, as I say, when Justin Bieber can command the religious ecstasy of a million young girls. Um, you might say, well, that's a very different thing. Not to them, right? So ask them about, ask that young girl about their experience of the concert and how changing and how it affects her life. Ask the person who goes to see Amachi from India, who is essentially a Hindu uh, aesthete uh, or saint, and uh, ask them how they feel about her. And it's very similar probably register on an, on, a, on an EEG and so forth and you would see benefits on the heart and the blood pressure and all kinds of things. Um, now Justin Bieber isn't leading a huge philanthropic organization and building huts for people. Ama is. So you can make those distinctions of course. It's not exactly the same. But uh, there is a lot of comparison that a lot of people who are spiritual don't often make um, because people enjoy exclusivity. They enjoy finding the one, the way. And whether or not they presume it's a better way than anyone else's, it's certainly the way for them. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I want to get the maximum amount of growth out of life. Um, I've I found a lot of benefits from focusing on, say, the Anastasia books for many years, and I really believe that this man, the character he was describing, was a real person, when in fact I have no evidence for that. And that's a step of mental growth for me. And I entertain these things, um, because they contain information that's beneficial. And sometimes, I think for certain individuals, maybe not for you, maybe for me, 
um, accepting something, accepting a premise, um, facilitates the communication of ideas um, that I might not otherwise have entertained or taken as seriously. And this way, the, the spiritual uh, confidence trickster, which is generally what they are, um, is performing a public service. At the same time, they could be a complete maniac. So um, all kinds of things can create all kinds of benefits and all kinds of deficits. Um, nothing is certain. Um, but we can do the best we can to ascertain this animal, as I say, of human, human imagination and human psychology, which, if nothing else, even if it's all false, even if it's all stupid and made up, um, we possess, obviously, an incredible imagination, an incredible psyche that we discount or preclude from any area of our life to our detriment. Um, like with diet, I say, like, don't control what it eats, just focus on nourishing it. We nourish our minds. I don't think we're getting nourished enough. Uh, I think our imaginative faculties are atrophied, and uh, our critical thinking is atrophied. Um, I think it's not a bad idea for everyone to find a little more space in their life to think to meditate, to question, um, to put themselves more in the way to experience some of the more direct benefits, the, the blessings of the incredible flow of creation and culture within and around us. Uh, that the human soul is a real thing. Uh, I've seen it. Um, I felt it. I think if you've ever had a friend, um, there are just so many little and big ways that indicate to me that there is a strata of human psychology that's utterly independent of what we call the physical world, and whose relevance as an administrative function in nature is beyond any current concepts in our society, and, and much to our detriment. So I will leave you with that, and uh, bid, you, bid you good day.